excellent, and the fellowship is superb. So, you know, I'm, I'm going through a season right now that the Lord is speaking to me about the prophetic and how important it is in the church and what it should look like. Um, you know, this morning, we actually were witnesses and heard you know, how the Lord speaks in one portion, in one way, in the prophetic. Uh, but, you know, sometimes we actually allocate prophetic ministry to certain individuals in the church, uh, usually leaders or elders of that type, and we kind of leave the responsibility there, whereas I believe that we are now in the generation of Joel chapter 2, where the Lord is calling sons and daughters into the prophetic. Um, this may very well be that generation, that end time generation. Certainly we see the signs around us, uh, but the Lord is speaking. Listen, I, I know that the world is speaking, that chaos is speaking, that the demonic is speaking and yelling out. But how many of us know that God is speaking? Amen. God hasn't stopped speaking. And I believe that the Lord is instilling in the church, in his sons and daughters, a word for this season that one, we would encourage each other, but secondly, that we would display the kingdom of God. There's a verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, actually two verses uh, that I just want to release to you, but there's uh, one specifically. Um, verse 8. And it says this, but as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his spirit. Hello? It's through his spirit. When the prophetic anointing is real, that it always comes through the Holy Spirit. It never comes through just the efforts of a man. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. And so, as we are living in the days of tremendous uncertainty, surrounded by questions ranging from economic turmoil to national security, violence to widespread diseases and epidemics, racial tensions to gender confusion, and even sexual dysfunction, no one with a carnal mind can discern what is happening in our society socially, economically, or culturally. That if there ever was a time in which God's people needed to hear what God was saying and what his direction is, it is now that our ear would be pressed against the heart of the Father and through the interpretation, the revelation of the Holy Spirit in sons and daughters reveal the word of the Lord to us that we would be effective sons and daughters, kings and priests 
unto himself and we would have a word for our generation and that we would have a surety within our heart that we're not affected and, uh, and, and, and running in a, a panic and fear as the world would do as we read you know, some of the things that are coming upon us that we would not be those that are running and hiding but we would be the voice of the Lord even in the sense of all chaos that would break out that we would know in whom we have believed and what the voice of the Lord is to our heart, to our, to our families, to our church family, and to the society that the Lord has placed us in. Listen, we are living in the generation that may very well usher in the return of Jesus Christ and his kingdom on the earth. And as the bride of Christ, we need to be ready and be listening to what God is doing and what the Spirit is saying in this hour. As we look back into the Old Testament, the Spirit always had a word through the prophets in what God was saying, in direction in how the people were to conduct themselves, in the direction that they needed to go. Listen, God's Spirit is still speaking, and He speaks to us. He still places prophets among us. He still places the, the prophetic prophetic message within sons and daughters and now he is working in us through his spirit that has come to us and lives in us and speaks in us and rises up in us that this generation would proclaim the goodness of God and that we would be those that would call out unto the name of the Lord. Listen, the Lord in his mercy is releasing revelation. Everybody say revelation. revelation. Come on, you know what that word revelation means? If you look it up in the original Greek, the word is actually interpreted to take the cover off. Everybody say to take the cover off. Sometimes when we read the word of God, you know, it seems that, you know, there is a cover on it. We don't understand everything. You know, how many of us, you know, I know I do. And I say, you know, Holy Spirit, what does this actually mean to me? How do I actually apply this portion of scripture to me? Especially when you're reading some things that, you know, seem to be really obscure and even outdated. And you're wondering, you know, uh, you know why the Holy Spirit is, is showing you that portion of scripture. But, you know... What happens is that unless we have revelation, unless the Holy Spirit comes, he is the spirit of revelation. He's the spirit of truth. Jesus tells us, uh, I believe in John chapter uh, 17, he says that he will come and he will reveal to us uh, the heart of, the, of Jesus himself. And so when he comes, he brings his truth. And through that truth, uh, we see what the heart of the Father is saying clearly. Everybody say clearly. God doesn't want us to be confused. Come on, everybody say, God doesn't want me to be confused. Come on, say it again, God doesn't want me to be confused. So he brings this revelation through his word. He takes the cover off and he brings to light. And all of a sudden, something that seemed, you know, to be relevant for 2,000 years ago is something that I'm, I need right now. Something that God is saying to me right now. God is preparing for something right now. Everybody say, right now. That's why the Holy Spirit gives revelation. I was sharing with the worship team inside that this morning the Lord took me into the book of Malachi and the very first words of Malachi just stood out to me. It says this, and the burden of the Lord came to Malachi. And the burden of the Lord came to Malachi. And I was thinking about that and I say, Lord, what does that word burden mean? Does that mean that, you know, he, he felt the heaviness and the Holy Spirit said, yeah. You see, the Holy Spirit speaks to us and brings the word into our life. He brings a message. We're messengers. Everybody say, I'm a messenger. I'm a messenger. And he brings us a message to release. And it is like a burden. It is like a weight upon us until we release that message in the time point, in the time frame that God has given us to release it. And we're not relieved of that burden, of that weightiness, of that heaviness of what God has placed upon our heart because it's heavy on God's heart to release it. He may want to release it into your spouse. He may want to release it into your children. He may want to release it into your co-workers or in the, the place in which you, you live, your neighbors, your, your neighborhood, into the nations. God is speaking in right now into the church to be the prophets, to speak out the word of the Lord and we are carrying this burden. We're messengers 
they carry the burden of the Lord. And, and we will not be released of this burden, of this weightiness, until the Holy Spirit brings it out and we begin to speak out what God says. Everybody says God says. It doesn't matter what the what CNN says or what the CSNBC or what Fox News says or anything else says. It's what matters is what God says. He releases revelation knowledge. Not just stuff that, you know, okay, so I know about this. But knowledge. Everybody say knowledge. His mercy is releasing revelation knowledge through the prophetic that will empower the people of God with wisdom, with direction, and insight into the counsel of his will. So that we're not just speaking on our own. We're not just speaking something that's fancy. We're not just Paris and what other people are saying. But we're saying, we're releasing, we're speaking out what God is saying to reveal the heart of the Father. Look at what it says in Joel chapter 2 and verse 28. Come on, turn there if you got your, your phone your iPads, if you've got your, your hardcover Bibles, whatever you have, to, let's read it together. This is so important that the word of the Lord is so relevant to us that we're touching the word of God. I tell you what, when I read the word of God in the morning, I like to place my hand over it. Almost as if I want to feel the words, the breath of God coming out and exactly what he's saying. In, in this portion of scripture, Joel in, Joel in chapter 2 and verse 28, he's prophesying and speaking. The Lord is speaking through Joel a word of the revelation of the generation that we're living in today, I believe. And he's saying this, and it shall come to pass that afterward I will pour out my spirit upon who? Upon all flesh. I'm going to pour out my spirit upon all flesh. You know what that means? That means that the people that you say are, you know, they're never going to get saved. Man, they're so far from God. You know, they're such enemies of God that the Holy Spirit is coming down with a word of salvation to meet people where they are. The lowest, uh, you know, of places in which people find themselves. The gutter places of life. And listen, I'm not just talking about the people that are poor. I'm talking about the Wall Street people. I'm talking about the financiers. I'm talking about doctors and lawyers. The Holy Spirit is coming down with an anointing for the word of God to bring out people and to, and to release a word of salvation into their life. He says, I'm going to pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Come on, say that's me. Come on, say that's me. Yeah. Upon all flesh includes me. And look what he says here now. This is very important. Your son's and your daughters shall prophesy. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Everybody say dream dreams. And your young men shall see visions. Come on, young men. Say it. See visions. I'm going to see visions. The Holy Spirit is releasing the prophetic anointing into the church across generational gaps. Where over the time the culture separated the generational structure, the Holy Spirit today is again uniting the bride of Christ to work together in different aspects of the prophetic that have diverse functions of ministry, yet work together in unison with each other to declare, one, that Jesus is Lord, and secondly, to proclaim that the kingdom of God is on earth. The Lord has said this. He says, and the sons of and daughters of the kingdom shall prophesy. He's saying the sons and the daughters of the kingdom shall prophesy. You and I are sons and daughters of the kingdom. You and I are sons and daughters of the kingdom. He didn't say just the pastor is going to prophesy or the, the elders are going to prophesy or the bishops are going to prophesy. He's saying sons and daughters. Somebody take care of the lights, please. Sons and daughters shall prophesy. They shall bring forth what is in my heart. They shall speak the burden that is in my heart. I will release that through the person of the Holy Spirit into their lives. They shall have the same burden that I do. And they will not rest until the word of the Lord is released from them. And
and the kingdom of heaven shall come upon the earth. In other words, what he's saying here is that this generation will be given boldness and in an abundance of grace in the face of fierce demonic opposition to declare the power of the kingdom of God. You know what I'm seeing in the news today? I'm seeing that a lot of things that somehow we've incorporated into our culture Things that are demonically devised that we have accepted and the church has taken a back seat and we've closed the doors to the outside. And, you know, we come in and we worship in our fancy churches. We sing all the nice songs because we're nice and safe in the cinder block walls. Well, you know what? Jesus is opening and blowing the doors off the hidden That's what it means when it says that he's going to release this prophetic anointing over the church. He's releasing the word that is upon his heart into the culture. And what's happening around is, listen, if you don't bother a hornet's nest, they'll leave you alone. But the moment you start approaching, you stir up that hornet's nest, they're all going to go crazy. Why? Because you're going after the very thing that keeps them safe and occupied. And what's happening right now is the Holy Spirit is bringing out a word and he's stirring up. He's stirring up the vipers. He's stirring up the things that have been so comfortable and they've taken over the land. They've taken over the, our culture. They've taken over the way that we think. The, 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 the things that we've uh, accepted and made acceptable into our lives. The vile things. Uh, the Holy Spirit is coming in and his word is breaking up uh, the things that Satan has put his culture on. Sons and daughters will prophesy. Jesus said in Mark chapter 16, verses 17 and 18, he says, and these signs will follow them. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up servants, and they will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. This is what Jesus is telling us. Listen, he's saying that the prophetic anointing declares what God said, and through the Holy Spirit, in this people, with uh, through his people, he releases the power of the kingdom on the earth. This is what he's saying when he says, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. The things that, you know, we felt that, you know, we were untrained for, that we're, we're not equipped to do, the Holy Spirit saying, I'm all the equipment that you need, I'm all the voice that you need, I'm all the power that you need, and I'm going to send you forth uh, uh, to proclaim what's on the heart of my father. What does the prophetic look like in kingdom terms? What does the prophetic look like in kingdom terms? Jesus is telling us. They will cast out satanic oppression and break demonic strongholds. They will speak in new tongues to declare the kingdom of God in all languages. They will step on and trample vile and poisonous ideologies that are contrary to God's truth. They will have a powerful healing anointing released through the laying on of their hands and the sick and in the name of Jesus release healing for cancer, for AIDS, for heart disease, for tumors, for blindness, for epilepsy, for, ki for, kingdom, for, for kidney disease, for blood deficiencies, for muscular deterioration, for mental illness, the lame will walk, the deaf will hear, the mute will speak, and yes, even baldness will be cured. Hallelujah. He's releasing the heart of the Father. He's releasing what God has said to be true. What the enemy has clouded us. Clouded the thinking. He's lied to us. And somehow we've accepted it as 
in the prophetic, the Bible tells us that your old men will dream. Listen, the dream always comes to the fathers. Listen to me, fathers. Listen to me this morning. I know this is not Father's Day. Maybe we'll skip church that day, huh? Because I'll speak to the fathers this morning. No. The dream comes to the fathers. When fathers stop dreaming, the young men will be without vision and the next generation dies in confusion. All around us, we see the effects of a culture that lacks a father's dream that is inspired by God. Everybody say, it's God's dream. Come on, say it. It's God's dream. God created us to instill his dream in us. That's what was happening in the Garden of Eden, right? Until the enemy somehow influenced mankind and separated God's dream from man. But God was pouring out. When the Bible says that the Lord was walking through the garden with Adam, what was he doing? He was revealing his heart. Could you imagine? Come on. Walking with God. With God. I'm not talking about, you know, he sent an angel. He, Adam was walking with God. He was walking with a ghost. And as they're walking, they're talking to each other. And God is telling Adam things that are deep within his heart. I can't wait to get to heaven one day and ask Adam exactly what was going on in that garden. I'll ask Jesus too. But there was something that was being revealed between the two of them that was so intimate and precious that when sin happened, it broke off. That revelation. But what did Jesus do? He died on the cross. He rose again. And he sent the Holy Spirit. And now that same voice that was speaking to Adam lives inside of us. And he longs to reveal. He longs to reveal. The same things he was revealing to Adam. The same plans that he was showing Adam. You see. But the dream always comes to the Father. It's God's dream, but it comes to the fathers. All around us, we see the effects of a culture that lacks that dream that is inspired by God. Fathers have confused God's dream with the American dream, and we're paying the price with the consequences of multiple generations that are marked in confusion spiritually, spiritually ethically, socially, economically, and sexually. Fathers have prostituted themselves to ideologies of working for selfish gain of pride, money, power, and materialism while abandoning God's dream of living, loving Him first and raising up godly families that will encounter the culture with the love of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, seek the kingdom of God and His righteousness, not the kingdom of the culture and its compromise. In effect, the dream has become a nightmare as fathers have abandoned their children and the children are victims of an orphan spirit that strips the generation of God's plan in their life and they don't have a face of an identity. Walking around because the father's dream that was given by God is not instilled in them. And we have a culture that is sick and dying and rebelling, crying out for the Father's dream. The Holy Spirit wants to restore the dream to the fathers again. A Jacob's dream of blessing and generational promises. The dream of God's perfect plan and a holy generation that will be lovers of God with the blessing of God upon their lives, their families, and their cities. When fathers dream God's dream, the young men will have a clear vision of their lives to encounter the culture of the, of the holy anointing. Listen, you want to see your children happy and prosperous? Uh, serve God and love God with all your heart. And you will see the power of the Lord coming upon your family. And you will see freedom. And you will see young men that will have vision for their lives to go forward. They will change the culture. The culture will not change them. Fathers with a dream that God instills. 
God gives the dream to fathers as a revelation of his heart. And then the young men use the dream that God has placed in the father as a foundation to cast new vision by the Holy Spirit. Wow. Did you get that? God gives the dream. It's God's dream. God gives the dream. Men of God with that dream as they're loving God, as they're loving their families, as they're, 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 they're prosperous in the ways of the Lord, are laying a foundation of that dream of what God has envisioned, just as it was in the Garden of Eden. Perfect. He, he, they, he lays this foundation. On that foundation, the young men come, the next generation comes, and they begin to cast new vision on what? A new dream? It's the vision of the fathers. It's always been about God's dream. On that dream, God gives a relevant vision for your generation. That you would go out and change the culture. We need the fathers to dream. We need the young men to cast vision. And your old men shall dream, and your young men shall have visions, the Bible says. In biblical days, Israel had an advantage over the other nations. Why? Why? Why did Israel have an advantage over the other nations? Because they possessed the oracles of God. Now, they often would not. And because of their rebellion, often they were punished. To be specific, 70 years of incarceration and bondage by foreign nations. But they possessed the oracles of God. In Romans chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, it says this. What advantage then has the Jew? Much in every way. Chiefly because to them were committed the oracles of God. The prophetic scripture gives Israel an advantage in preparing them for the coming Messiah. They were waiting for the Messiah. Now, when he came, they missed him because they were looking for the wrong things. But they knew. The prophets told them. Scripture told them. God would continuously show them signs of this Messiah. But they were looking for something else. But yet they, they possessed the truth. They knew exactly where he was going to be born. The Lord has empowered the church with an anointing to communicate his heart and mind accurately. Accurately. And this is what I say to us this morning. That we're not taking lightly the word of the Lord that comes to us. Whether you're praying and meditating on it early in the morning or the Lord is giving you scripture in the evening time or during the day. You know when you sit down with the Lord, come on. Or when we come and we have prayer time together. Or when we come and we have a gathering like this. That we're not taking for granted the word of the Lord that's coming to us. Why? Because every time that we allow the cover to be lifted. That fresh revelation comes, and the Lord is saying, I'm speaking to my prophet. I'm putting my message into your heart, and you will carry my burden upon your heart, and you will feel the burden that I'm feeling until such time that I give you to release that burden into the place that I've ordained you to speak it out. We're called to be oracles of what the Spirit is saying in this hour. Hello? In this hour. Everybody say in this hour. God moved in tremendous and beautiful ways in past generations. And then I would long to sit in one of those revival times that my grandparents would talk about with tears in their eyes 
And the joy that they felt as God was setting people free and moving. But I'm not satisfied in just listening to what God was doing yesterday. If in truth I believe that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, I need to feel his presence relevant for my life today. I need that word to be relevant for me today. And so the oracle of God sits within me. It sits within you. The Holy Spirit is speaking to you. Even in, even in this moment that we're gathered together, the Holy Spirit is speaking to us, placing an oracle in us that we would not take it lightly, but we would feel the burden of the Lord upon our heart as God the Father is feeling that burden right now. And he's releasing the Holy Spirit that time, that Kairos moment, to release the word of God out. The church will speak as an oracle of God when we give ear to what the Spirit is saying and we declare it with power and kingdom authority. They work together. Hello? Power and kingdom authority work together. Let me say it again. Power and kingdom authority work together. Somebody got it. Power and kingdom authority work together. Remember what Jesus said? They shall. That's me. That's you. That's you. So if the Lord is placing somebody upon your heart, pray for them. Maybe it's in the middle of the night. Lord, I don't want to get up. Pray. There's a reason why the Lord is placing somebody on your heart. Maybe you don't even know their name. There's a face. He's not obscure. He's showing you something. He's showing me something. The oracles of God. The oracles of God. Lord, I've received your word, and I'm set it free. We declare it with power and authority on the earth. And this is what it means to prophetically operate on earth as it is in heaven. First Peter chapter in verse 11. I'm going to close with this. In fact, stand with me. This is what it says. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and dominion and power forever and ever. Amen. All heads bowed, every eye closed. This morning, the Lord is calling you to be a prophet. In your own little world, God is calling you to be a prophet. In your marriage, God is calling you to be a prophet. In your household, God is calling you to be a prophet. In your workplace, God is calling you to be a prophet. And yes, you don't have to wait till Sunday morning, but in church, God is calling you to be a prophet when we gather. I've even spoken to some of you personally on this. What God had laid upon my heart, and I believe the Lord pointed some of you out specifically. The Lord is saying, exercise what the Spirit is saying in your heart right now. Exercise it for this season. Speak out the oracles of God. Don't shut them down. Jesus says the rocks will cry out. The last thing you want to do is take what God has placed on your heart as a burden into your grave one day. It's life. The scriptures are life. The word of God gives life. And he wants to give life to us this morning. Maybe there's somebody here who doesn't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. 
See, I can't close any service. I don't care if there's one or 20 or 100 or 1,000. I can't close a service unless I ask this question because the Holy Spirit is asking this. If you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, the Lord says, I knew you in your mother's womb. And there my hand formed you. He's saying, I'm calling out your name. You won't find rest in your life until you come and lay it all down. I've called you to be a prophet. If there's somebody here this morning, you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Jesus is calling. I just want to pray for you. Come on. Slip up your head. Let me hear what God is saying concerning you. He's not a God of condemnation. He's a God of love. He's not a God that separates. He's a God to bring together. And I'll tell you what. When Jesus went to that cross, he was stripped naked. Talk about shame. Jesus had no shame. Because the Bible says, for the joy that was set before him, he saw your face and my face right now, in this moment. And so if you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, this is your opportunity. I'll tell you what, all morning I've been thinking about the situation with Pastor Joe. I don't know that he woke up yesterday morning and said, you know, this is my final day on earth. Beautifully, and as a memorial to him, he lived his life for Jesus. He spoke the word of the Lord as it was given to him. And he stands before the Lord, and I can hear the Lord saying to him, Well done, my good and faithful servant. But if you're waiting for the next opportunity for another time, or maybe to do it, you know, in a secret place somewhere, I tell you now, you're ashamed of the Lord. The Lord is releasing a prophetic anointing upon this body. And he's, and he's looking for you to place that burden. But it can't happen until first we release our life before him. There's somebody here that doesn't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. I want to pray for you. Maybe there's somebody here. You've been struggling with the prophetic. You know that God has been speaking to you. But the Lord has been saying things into your life and wants you to release. But somehow you've allowed the cares of life, you've allowed situations and brokenness, maybe failures that you've encountered, to trip over it and keep you hostage. It's exactly what the enemy wants. The Lord is saying, I've placed my spirit inside of you. I've given you my oracle. It's time to release before the Lord. This is you this morning. I'm just going to open up the altars. And if this morning you're just not sure and you want a prophetic anointing upon your life, you want to hear God in a clear way, not just some religious way on Sunday morning, but a clear voice of God, I'm going to open up the altars. This is not something where... You're proving to everybody how weak you are. This is about you and your heavenly Father. What God has placed in your life. The altars.